Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And Shabbat Shalom, everyone who's joining us online for today's Torah portion, Vayigash. We'll be reading today from Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 44, starting at verse 18. And before we do, join me as we recite the blessing before reading the Torah. Baruchu et Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bekar Banu Mikol HaAmim Venetan Lano Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai no ten hatorah. Amen. Bless Adonai who is blessed. Blessed is Adonai who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. We'll be reading today from today's portion. Again, Bereshit, Genesis chapter 44, uh, verse 18 through 20. We'll read in the Hebrew. And it says in the Hebrew, Vayigash elav Yehuda, Vayomer bi Adoni, Yedaber na avdecha, Davar beotsne Adoni, Vealichar abcha, Be'avdecha ki hamocha ke faro. Adoni sha'al et avadav lemor chayesh lachem av av o ach. Vanomer el Adoni yesh lanu az zaken vayeled zekunim katan ve'achiv Met vayi vater hu levado li amo ve aviv a hevo. Genesis forty four eighteen. Then Yehuda approached Yosef and said, Please, my lord, let your servant say something to you privately, and don't be angry with your servant. For you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asks his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? We answered, My Lord, We have a father who is an old man and a child of his old age, a little one whose brother is dead, so that of his mother's children he alone is left, and his father loves him. But you said to your servants, Bring him down to me so that I can see him. We answered, My Lord, the boy can't leave his father. If he were to leave his father, his father would die. You said to your servants, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. We went up to your servant, my father, and told him what my Lord had said. But when our father said, go again and buy us some food, we answered, we can't go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go down, because we can't see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. The one went out from me, and I said, surely he has been torn to pieces, and I haven't seen him since. Now if you take this one away from me too, and something happens to him, you will bring my gray hair down to show with grief. So now if I go to your servant, my father, and the boy isn't with us, Seeing how his heart is bound up with the boy's heart, when he sees that the boy isn't with us, he will die. And your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant, our father, down to Shoal with grief. For your servant himself guaranteed his safety. I said, if I fail to bring him to you, then I will bear the blame before my father forever. Therefore, I beg you, let your servant stay as a slave to my Lord instead of the boy. And let the boy go up with his brothers. For now I can go up to my father. For how can I go up to my father if the boy isn't with me? I couldn't bear to see my father so overwhelmed with anguish. 
Join me as we recite the blessing after reading the Torah portion. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu Torah emet Vechaye olam netabet ohenu Baruch atah Adonai No ten ha Torah Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us the Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Thank you very much, Stacy. You may be seated. This Torah portion, Parashat Vayigash, means, and he approached. And again, it begins in Genesis 44, 18, and it ends in Genesis 47, 27. And let me give you a little brief overview of this. We want to hit in a few things today. Judah approaches Joseph to plead for the release of Benjamin, offering himself as a slave to the Egyptian ruler in Benjamin's place. Upon witnessing his brother's loyalty to one another, Joseph reveals his identity to them. And he declares to them, I am Joseph. They recognize him and he asks, is my father still alive? The brothers at this point are ashamed. They remember the past. They remember what they had done, all of these things. But Joseph gives them a a word of comfort. And he tells them, it has been ordained by God that this should happen. So in other words, don't be ashamed. Let's pick up from here. Let's establish, reestablish a relationship. God has been involved in this whole thing. So the brothers, they rush back to Canaan with the good news. Jacob comes to Egypt with his sons and their families, 70 souls in all. He's reunited with his son after 22 years. And on his way to Egypt, he receives a divine promise. Fear not to go down to Egypt, for I will there make you a great nation. I will go down with you into Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. Joseph gathers the wealth of Egypt by selling food and seed during the time of famine. Pharaoh gives Jacob's family the fertile uh, county of Goshen to settle, and the children of Israel prosper in their Egyptian exile. This is really big for to hear this idea of God saying, I will bring you down and then I'll raise you up. God saying this to them. We don't hear that a lot, this idea of God bringing someone down. Or at least we don't hear it in the context of, hey, it's okay for God to bring you down. It kind of goes against human nature. We want God to lift us up and to raise us up. Amen. So we see some of this today going on. I want to get into much of this, but the house of Israel, today they're working on freeing their brother who's in captivity in Egypt, as it were, or in a lower place, a place that is not Israel, outside of Israel, etc. So we keep seeing these Torah portions come up with the same thing, with this idea of Israel, the house of Israel, the brothers of Israel, the sons of Israel, having to be united to come together despite all of their differences to save those who were in captivity. And God is looking, or um, the one who is the, the captives, they're looking and they're saying something like, is God really alive? God really there? It's like Joseph is saying, is my father still alive? Doesn't he see my plight here? So we remain steadfast in prayer for Israel. Amen? Amen. But I want to go through this with you. Starting in in chapter 45, I want you to go, I'm going to skim over this. You're going to see a few words that keep coming up and a few ideas that keep coming up that I want to talk about. 45.19 says, moreover, or let's let's start at 45.17, Pharaoh said to Yosef, tell your brothers, here is what you are to do. Load up your animals. Go to the land of Canaan. 
Take your father and your enemies and come back to me and I will give you good property in Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. This is Pharaoh blessing Joseph. This is a Gentile pagan blessing the house of Israel and making promises to them. Verse 15, uh, 19, chapter 45, Moreover, and this is an order, do this. And then it says, what does it say? Anybody have theirs in front of them? Take wagons, or take the wagons, remember that, from the land of Egypt to carry your little ones and your wives and bring your father. Skipping down to verse 21, the sons of Israel acted accordingly, and Joseph did what? Gave them wagons as Pharaoh ordered and gave them provisions for their journey. Skip down a little further, verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt, or they went up from Egypt, entered the land of Canaan, and came to Yaakov, their father. You're going to notice a pattern here. Whenever they leave Egypt, they're going up. Whenever they leave Canaan to go back to Egypt, they're, descend, they're going down. Verse 27, so they reported to him everything Yosef had said to them, but it was only when he saw, what did he see? The wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him in that the spirit of Yaakov, their father, began to revive. Wow. This word spirit, just because we've been talking about this idea, the differences between the um, the nephesh and the shaman and the ruach. In the text, this word comes up as ruach. So what does that tell us? We'll talk about this for a minute. It says his, see, context matters, even with the word ruach. Does it mean that it says, if you look at this um, specific, or what's the word I'm looking for? Um, If you look at this just naturally um, or without the context of what it's trying to say, or, let me ask you this, what is it trying to say? Is it trying to say that his Ruach was dead, physically dead, and he began to revive like he got CPR? Or what does it mean by Ruach in this context? Yeah. It said his, and Yosef, um, so they reported to him everything Joseph had said to them, but it was only when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him that the spirit, the ruach of Yaakov, their father, began to revive. The context, of, what does that mean? He'd been in depression, and then because of this, he started coming out of depression. Yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? What had been absent? Well, so that's what I want to talk about, the context of it. Because if you look at it like that, very, uh, like his ruach, if literal is the word I'm getting at. We, we can't look at this literally because we know that his ruach didn't just leave him. It was like, oh, it was dead. Then it began to revive. So let's keep on working that. It connects, well, yeah, but that's all true. But in the context of what it's saying here, basically like it was saying, like he was depressed. Like he's saying, what do I have to live for? Shabbat shalom. Look at all of this. But then he saw these wagons loaded with stuff. Shabbat shalom, guys. And what happened? It caused him to, just like right now, everyone saw them, what happened? Our Ruach started to revive. It came up another notch. Perfect timing when we saw, it wasn't a wagon, we saw the stroller, you know, and them coming in, and we were revived. Our countenance changed. That makes sense? So let's keep talking about this. We've seen this idea of the wagons three times. And it wasn't until he saw the wagons that he get his countenance began to get revived. 
But I want to read a few more verses to you. I want to go back. 4421, I'm going to skim over this. But you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him. Bring him down is implying going where? To Egypt. Verse 44, 26, we answered, we can't go down to Egypt. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go down because we can't see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. So we keep seeing this idea of going down. Going down naturally is also going down spiritually. And I don't like using the term spiritual, but basically concerning those things that happen outside of time and space in our, concerning our Ruach and our Nishama, right? Going down, descending. Just like the opposite of that is going to Israel and making Aliyah, going up, right? Going to Jerusalem. So keep this in mind. We talked a few weeks ago, this idea, this is the third and final portion that involves Joseph. And remember we talked about this idea that it was always Hashem's plan to do what with the children of Israel? To cause them to go down, to descend physically into Egypt, spiritually, so that what? Just like he told the brothers, so that I will make you into a great nation. This is kind of counterintuitive to what we hear a lot. We hear a lot from a lot of the body this idea that if you're like not on the top, you know, and shine and everything is great, then something is wrong. That's not universally what's taught, but that's a big segment of the body teaches this idea of, hey, what's the matter with you? Everything's not perfect. You're not ascending and you're not this bright star. Something must be wrong. You need to see God. I don't know if I want to spend any time with you. I don't want that getting off on me. I want to be around the rising shooting star. And not biblical at all. The biblical side is, Lord, whatever you want to do while I'm here, I am. I may not even like it. That's okay. You know, God's okay with you not liking some of the stuff he asks you to do. He's even okay with you saying, God, I don't like this at all. That's okay, too. Most of us have children here, or if we don't have children, we were a child at one point, I'm assuming. And we say to our parents, hey, I don't, you know, I used to have to take out the trash. That was my job, the youngest boy of nine kids. Sometimes I didn't like it. Sometimes it was raining outside. Sometimes I had to walk through the mud to go take the trash. I don't want to do that. You know, and my sisters, they washed the dishes. They didn't want to do it. Sometimes we had food I didn't want to eat. I don't want to eat this. And the longer you waited, this is pre-microwave. So if, you, if it got cold on, you just got cold. And we're from the South. We ate a lot of grits. And anyone can tell you who's ever eaten grits before is one thing. You don't want to let grits get cold. Once grits gets cold... They just, and you're eating like a, 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 a gritty brick, a gritty gelatinous brick. You don't want to do that. So we say to our parents, I don't like this. And they say, that's okay. I'm still your parent. I'm still telling you what you need to do, and you need to do it, if, whether you like it or not. I love what Messiah said when he said, Lord, is it possible that you can take this cup from me? Because in effect, what was he saying? I don't want to do this. And he goes on to say, but nevertheless, your will be done. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. So we see this idea of God. His, his plan was always to bring the children of Israel down to Egypt. And we see that in this word here. Multiple times we've read the word, and he saw the wagons, he saw the wagons, he saw the wagons. Why do you think he got excited when he saw the wagons? Um, and a, an example of that is uh, Genesis 45, 19. 
if you're trying to find it back there. 45.19 and 45.21. What's that? Time to go by. He, and, so, and that represents, you know, he just heard he's going to see his son. He sees these wagons, these Egyptian wagons that have been brought from Egypt to um, bring things and to bring things back. And I was going to put up a slide today, but I didn't have a chance to get it done. My apologies. But I want, to, I want you to write something down. The word for wagons in Hebrew. Or wag, well, it's, wa, it's wagon and wagons. So the word for wagons is agalot. A G A L O T. If you want to write it in Hebrew, it's Ein Gimel Lamed Vav and Tav. A single wagon would be a gal. When you're looking at Hebrew, these words always mean something. They have multiple meanings. So anybody recognize what we see in that word or what pops up? And it's okay if you don't, but this is just a challenge to think and to see. When you look at it in Hebrew, it pops right out at you. Huh? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's uh, a gimel, not a vav. That's, um, yeah, and it's an I and not a, an olive too, yeah. Well, that just means, oh, for the good thing, that just means plural, right? Lot. Right, right. <laughs> no, 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 and I get it. This is the stuff we want to continue to work through. So when you see O-T in the Hebrew word, what does that mean? Plural. Uh, oh, yeah, feminine. Feminine. Um, oat. So what is a single wagon? A gal, right? And multiple is agalot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but when you look at it in Hebrew, ayin, gimel, lamid, vav, and tav. So I want to give you a couple words for this. Remember they were going down. They were going, you see, in... We just read here, well, actually I just read this, let's see. You see this idea of that they're going into exile. And what is another word for exile? Galut. In the word wagons, agalot is the word galut. And here are these wagons these agalot that is going to take them into the galut. That is going to cause them to be exiles. And it's all by the work of Hashem's hands. And here's an old man. He doesn't think he's ever going to see his son again. And he gets word that his son is still alive. Not only is he still alive, I'm going to take you to him. And his countenance and his spirit is revived. But he recognizes also he's not going the problem. He's in the land. He's going back into exile. You can see the idea why he wouldn't be happy. Um, he hadn't seen his son. He's going to die. He sees without seeing his son again. 22 years have passed. And now these wagons come. And again, in the word wagons is galut. This scripture is looked back upon once we get to Mount Sinai. Anybody have an idea why? What can we see in this word that points to Mount Sinai again? That what happened on Sinai would be, it would point back to this. There's another word in here, agal, wagon. How about egel? You guys remember egel, zahav. The golden calf. So we see this idea of God trying to or having to use something to bring them down, to lower them, to bring them into exile in order to lift them back up. 
We see that even the golden calf, he allowed something to happen to bring them down so that what happens? They can be lifted back up and come out of that. Yeah, you had a question or a thought? Egel. Egel Zahav? Yeah. Like E-G-E-L, Z-H-A-V, or the calf or the cow of gold. Egel Zahav. Yeah, it's, yeah, and you know what? I, we, I need to do more with putting stuff in Hebrew on the board so you can actually see it. You don't see it in Hebrew or in English at all. It doesn't come up. But I want to, last thing I want to uh, talk to you about is these last few, or a few of these verses in here. If you want to go to chapter number 46, and it says, Joseph brings his family back to Egypt. There's a lot of scriptures in Torah that we get to and you people uh, you don't know how to deal with them because you're trying to look at them in English or you're looking at them with no connection to uh, to what the rabbis taught about anything and I want to mention something to you here uh, let's see here The last verse of chapter 46, 26, it says, All people belonging to Yaakov coming into Egypt, his direct descendants, not counting Yaakov's sons' wives, totaled 66. But a little further up, it says 70. Do you have that right there in front of you, the verse? Where is it? I thought I had it. I don't have it marked here. It comes after. It's... It's 27. That's why I don't have it in front of me. So in verse 27, it says, And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. Yeah. All those of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. Interesting. What is up with this? This is like two verses. One says 26, one says 70. I'm, did I say 26? Verse 26 says 66. Verse 27 says 70. They were already, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, including Joseph. And there's a, an idea you see in verse 26. It says, not counting Yaakov's son's wives. Does that show up in your King James? Uh, Harris, uh, verse 26. Does it say not counting Yaakov's son's wives? Yeah. It does show up there? Okay. So I want to talk about this because this is, I had, I've had someone bring this up, and I've never talked about it, what the rabbis had to say about this. So let's read through this, but they connect it to some other things too, which is pretty awesome. It says, Every soul that was coming with Jacob, every soul that left Canaan or Canaan to go to Egypt, we see the word haba. Here, it is not a perfect tense, but a participle with a relative present tense, or present sense. Just as in Esther 2.4, it says, in the evening she, Ba, was coming. And Genesis 29.7 says, and behold, Rachel, his daughter, is coming. The same word. And therefore, the accent is on the last syllable, Haba, on the Aleph. Because when they left coming from the land of Canaan, there were only 66. But at the second mention of the word in Genesis 46.27, Every soul of the house of Jacob, which came, Haba, into Egypt, where 70 is a perfect tense, and therefore it is accented on the last, uh, the last but one syllable on the bet, or Haba, instead of Haba. Very slight, but this is why in Hebrew it matters. The reason is that when they came there, they were 70, for they found Joseph and his two sons there, and... Uh, uh, Jacobed was added to their number between uh, what they refer to as between the walls, which is a whole other thing I don't want to get into. There are some other very interesting things in here that the rabbis talk about, but there's always a reason. And I want this, I want to uh, leave you with this. In Vayikra Rabbah 4 6, when he left Canaan, it says in Genesis 36 6, Esau's family consisted of only six. 
himself and his five sons. And scripture calls them the souls of his house in the plural. And this is because they worship many gods, each serving a different God and having it, having as it were, a different soul or religious feeling. But the family of Jacob, when he came to Egypt, consisted of 70, and scripture calls them souls in the singular, or calls them soul in the singular because they all serve the one true God. That's just nuts. Here it is, the six of them, they serve different gods in the same household. I mean, you talk about going back to a state prior to Abraham when they had the ability to continue with the understanding that Abraham had and was passing on. And they just flat out just rejected it. Think about that. It shouldn't surprise us when we talk about these things that people just flat out just reject it. People talk about they want the blessings of Abraham. Oh my gosh, the blessings of Abraham will come upon the Gentiles. Hallelujah. You hear this kind of stuff. They don't want anything to do with Abraham and his family or what he did or what he understood. And you wonder, or actually you shouldn't wonder, you should just see kind of where people are. This idea of not counting Yaakov's son's wives, a rabbi wrote this idea that those wives... They would have added more, but those wives must, if they did, they must have died prior to them coming into Egypt. Interesting. It's interesting how everything has been answered or talked about and discussed in Scripture. There's nothing left out. Anybody have any thoughts or questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not counting Yaakov's sons' wives, yeah. Yeah, so that's the understanding and the reasoning that the rabbis have discussed as to why. Because if you count them, you count them, then they're over uh, 70, which is, I haven't gone off of that branch to see more what they talked about, but it's, there's always so much. Yeah. Anybody have any last thoughts? When all of Israel can come together and worship the one true God, that's when Hashem can actually move. Yeah. There's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. You see, you know, sorry, Therese. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't prompt that, but I do receive it because it was true. There's more to it than that. And so Esau, so look at the opposite side. Look at the, the sons of Esau that Israel is fighting against, that spirit, all worshiping all with different gods. I'm going to let you just chew on that for a second. You think about this idea of when Abraham came over and it says, it talked about the Hebrews, and we talked about this before. Who were Hebrews? They were just a loose band of people that came with Abraham and they crossed over with him. That's it. And then it kind of has become this name associated with Israel but it's not some official group of people. It's just an, a name or an idea. Now, it's, there's no group of Hebrews today. There was no group of Hebrews when they, that's just a, a name that's been associated almost like a, um, uh, a characterization as opposed to a group of people. Because that's just used terribly today. You know, um, like the, the whole idea of Hebrew roots. Well, what are you talking about? There's no such thing as Hebrew, Hebrew people. If you want to talk the roots of Hebrew of the language and Torah, okay, that's fine. But actually, you can't do that without practicing Judaism. So you're not, there's no, what exactly do you mean by that? So you see these terms used that are so loosey-goosey, they don't mean anything. And you don't know what people mean. If you ask 10 people that, they'll give you 10 different answers. Yeah, go ahead. No, it goes back to where when he crossed over, he was called a Hebrew. That was the idea when he crossed over from literally over a river, figuratively, um, he crossed over from pagan practices into, um, you know, the first one to serve the one true God, that kind of an idea. And there, were other, there were a group, a loose connection of other pagans who 
followed him and came with him. And they traveled a long way. It'd be like you traveling from here to like New York-ish, you know. Um, there's a midrash on Abraham when he was in with his parents that he used to go around and he would, um, oh gosh, what was it? I believe it was that he would light a candle to all these little pagan deities that were set up in the, in, uh, where his family sold the little, little idols. But he left from, so the idea is he left from that. Again, within time and space and outside of time and space, he left from the pagan practices. Now you have God bringing his people, his chosen people back into a lower state so that he can refine them, chastise, um, uh, restore all of these things all at the same time and a combination of them so that they can be found usable. Last thoughts? Yeah. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time we've had together. And we thank you, Father, that as we continue to move on in the service, that we'll continue to ask questions, O oh God, and talk and discuss and uh, learn more about the kingdom and how we can be used uh, more, more efficiently in the kingdom. We thank you and praise you for that, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen, amen. Shavuot tov, everyone.